he's telling me that people are selling their homes for Bitcoin, selling their businesses for Bitcoin, because even if Bitcoin crashes, they know that the value of that real estate's going to zero. Like, right. you know, no one's like investing in homes in Gaza, like they could be blown up. So, um, so he's like, look, worst case, it's the status quo, but best, best case, like, Bitcoin keeps doing what it's doing over time and we're, we're, we're getting out of here. So this guy, like the last thing he said to me basically was like, it's my, like I'm saving up for my kids and this is my ticket out of here. And, and I just think that the, the elites in the West are just so clueless about that. Like that even in one of the most restrictive, repressive, dystopian places on earth, Gaza, people are using Bitcoin to escape. It's just remarkable. One Love Bitcoin. This is Dread, and today I got the chance to interview Alex Gladstein from the Human Rights Foundation. We talked about his article on Palestine, and honestly, it was another rude awakening. Due to some recent tragedies in my family, it's become sharply into my focus now that the two things we really don't get any more of is time and Bitcoin. And in Palestine, time is still consistently being stolen from people who live there through manipulation of the currency or regulation of imports. We speak to Alex about this article in depth, but you can also read it at bitcoinmagazine.com or you can go to my boy Guy Swan's podcast, Bitcoin Audible, and hear the audio version of it. I hope this interview helps to spread knowledge and awareness about Palestine, because this story is a brutally clear example of what we're fighting for. Enjoy this one, people. One love. Alex, welcome to One Love Bitcoin, Bridgen. Greetings. Greetings. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, I've been waiting for this interview for a long time. Um, you've always been one of the people that I have like really followed and look up to, looked up to in terms of the, the different places that you've been, you've been able to, to not only learn from, but spread information about. So I'm glad you're on the show. Um, I'm hoping that you could, you know, tell everyone that's listening in Jamaica and around the world, you know, where did you came from? How did you came, come to become, you know, the, the person that's, that's highlighting all these facts about the worldwide issues that Bitcoin solves and not just the American ones? Sure. Well, again, pleasure to be here. Love what you all are doing. Um, I started my career in human rights in 2007. Uh, I started work at the Human Rights Foundation, which is what at the time was a small startup nonprofit run by a Venezuelan who was really upset that the world was not doing anything for the Venezuelan people because there was this general kind of like Bush era uh, support for Hugo Chavez um, that came from a, a very fair like antagonism for Bush and the invasion of Iraq. Okay, fine. A hundred percent right there with you. However, that does not excuse any sort of support for Hugo Chavez, who was 
in the early 2000s, systematically, especially towards the late 2000s, six, seven, eight, like systematically removing his critics, uh, disbarring the media, getting rid of anyone who disagreed with him. And, you know, yeah. yeah, I mean, turning into one. Okay. He ended up being one at the end before he died, but like he eroded democracy systematically and people were ideologically blind to that. So I joined an organization which was built to address issues like that, you know, basically built to address dictatorships that no one else wanted to talk about or issues that no one wanted to talk about. So Cuba was one of the first things we, we did. And my, my first job there was to make these like backpacks, which my colleagues would, you know, who were Latin American, they could like travel to Cuba easily and they would take these backpacks filled with like uh, DVDs that looked like it was just music, but really it had like dubbed versions of movies like V for Vendetta and uh, Woody Allen's Bananas and stuff like that. And, and, and they would go in and it would be used by the underground library movement, which didn't have internet access at the time. So they were totally reliant on like foreign stuff like this. And people would gather in their homes and watch this stuff and do discussion groups and things like that. So um, that was my first exposure to the work on the ground in the human rights space. And um, just been with HRF ever since we pioneered an event called the Oslo Freedom Forum, which gathers activists from all around the world to exchange notes with one another. Um, we run programs like Flash Drives for Freedom, which has gotten over more than 100,000 flash drives into North Korea, uh, where people don't have access to the internet. You know, those drives are packed with movies and books and films and information about the outside world. We have lawyers that work for us who help, we help put pressure on uh, governments to, to help free political prisoners. Uh, and we, we do some micro grants. Uh, we do a lot of publicity campaigns to educate the public about why dictatorship is bad. <laughs> why freedom is good. Um, and then uh, about five years ago, I, I got really into Bitcoin, basically. I, I, you know, we started accepting Bitcoin as an organization in 2014. And I had, you know, it came onto my radar the year before, but I didn't really start to grasp it until early 2017. It's kind of when all the pieces came together for me. And we started doing Bitcoin programming that year. So like basically introducing the, the activist community that we are connected with. Um, to Bitcoiners. So now, and we've just been doing that in an aggressive way ever since, like building up, building up, building up. So now when you attend an Oslo Freedom Forum event, there's like a Bitcoin Academy track mm -hmm. where you can learn about all the basics. Like, why would you need it? How do you use it? Like, tell me how I can raise money with it. Like, what are some best practices, et cetera, et cetera. So now it's kind of like, we're going to have that full scale service for the activist community. We think it's very important. We've done a lot of digital security work in the past. Starting in 2013, we, we started to provide robust security training for activists through partners, whether it be EFF or Citizen Lab or companies themselves that made these products, looking at why you would want to use something like Signal or a VPN, et cetera, et cetera. So Bitcoin is really just the next iteration of that. You have the struggle for communications privacy, and now you have the struggle for financial freedom. So um, that's part of the menu now that we offer. And I've just become fascinated with learning how people around the world are discovering Bitcoin and using it to fight back against oppression and to escape from unfair circumstances. And I've been doing a series of essays on this idea since April for Bitcoin magazine, where I don't have any restrictions on me in terms of I can write as much as I want. So these essays tend to be very long. And I've been exploring all kinds of topics in terms of like, mainly based around interpersonal interviews with people from different countries and just trying to give them a voice and, and tell their story in an effective way, which I think is the most important way to do it is through human stories. If you don't have the human element, it gets boring. Um, you can have all the stats or statistics in the world, but if you don't have a story, if you don't have a person, it's not as compelling. It's not as entertaining. No one's going to read it. But what I found is you can like weave the stats and the history in with the stories and it's, it's even better. Like it, it really is a great medium. So that's, that's what I've been specializing in is trying to weave that all together. And my latest piece came out a couple hours ago. I poured more work into it than any other piece I've done. It's like 13,000 words and it's, it's about Palestine and it's about the economic restrictions these people have faced over the decades and how they they're using Bitcoin to get out basically um, and to, and to give themselves a little bit of sovereignty in a, in a world where they have very little basically and where everybody else is aligned against them. 
not only Israel and the World Bank and the IMF and the Americans, et cetera, but even their own rulers. I mean, the yeah. Palestinian Authority is so corrupt and, and they basically exist to siphon off whatever they can for themselves. And they've made their own little elite class and um, they're not looking out for the average Palestinian. And and I mean, of course, Hamas is even worse. So, you know, it's not a pretty situation. Basically, you have a situation there where Palestinians are more optimistic about today than tomorrow. And that's that's a very deep and depressing thought. Like they, they don't there's just very little hope left because they're so jaded. Like in 93, 94, you had the Oslo process. OK, there was going to be peace in the Middle East. Right. No, man, that's not what happened. Like they, they got their sovereignty taken from them in a, in a sacrifice in exchange for personal gain and, and fame for Arafat and his cronies. And, you know, a bunch of people won a Nobel Peace Prize. But what ended up happening to the average Palestinian, the Palestinian economy was like increased dependence on not just the Israeli economy, like it had been during the military occupation, but foreign aid. So basically, like if the PA doesn't get uh, VAT and customs duties from Israel, which, which can be delayed and withheld, if it doesn't get foreign aid, it can't, it can't finance the public budget, it can't pay anybody. So they're, they're completely dependent on the outside world, yeah. which is crazy because they're restricted from the outside world. So not only like over the decades did this economy and the society and this people become dependent on the outside world, then oh, the walls came in. And now it's like to even get a computer to Ramallah, I mean, it might be 1500 bucks for a laptop in Tel Aviv. The same thing's gonna cost 3,500 in, in Ramallah because all the imports for Palestine have to go through Israel. They arrive, they're in storage, they have to get inspected. Then they go on a truck, the truck has to be stopped. Only so many trucks go in, stuff gets stolen. And, and then there's additional, there's taxes that get taken out when it arrives in Israel, which the Israeli state benefits from. And then there's taxes that taken by the, you know, by the PA on the merchant. So by the time there's a sale in Ramallah, even though they use the same currency as in Tel Aviv, they all use shekels. There's massive inflation in the, in the PA, in the PA's territories in the West Bank, whereas there isn't in Israel. In fact, the Israeli currency has been strengthening against the dollar over the last, um, you know, over the last 20 years, 25 percent. The, the shekel has, has appreciated against the dollar, 25 percent. And I explored a lot of these ideas like that people that, that I never thought about before, like, guess why the shekel's appreciating all this foreign aid and the, these, you know, imports for Palestinians coming in through Israel are in foreign currencies, dollars, Canadian dollars, euros, yen. The Israeli central bank takes those hard foreign currencies into their reserves and then prints shekels to, to give to the PA. Okay. So, so they're, they're strengthening their position by being the controlling power. And that's like, I mean, that's just screwed up, man. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, and it's something that nobody talks about. Right. So I wanted to talk about all these issues and look again, here's another situation where like, just like Nigeria or Sudan or so many other places I've looked at the powers that be, are not looking out for the average person. And you know, regardless of who's in charge, the current monetary financial economic system is, is something that benefits a handful at the expense of everybody else. So Bitcoin comes along and is a way out. So yeah. these people can connect to this global economy. And even in Gaza, I mean, people are selling their homes for Bitcoin. And I was like shocked. I, I got on the phone. I managed to get on a Telegram call with a Bitcoin user in Gaza. It was like one of the most amazing conversations I've ever had. And my friend helped me live. It was, you know, I don't speak Arabic. So it was live translated with my friend. And it was like middle of the night for him because they don't have very much electricity. They barely have any electricity because the whole freaking country is bombed. They only have one power plant in the whole country and it's running at very low capacity because uh, they don't, they can't import anything. There's only two checkpoints and like they barely get any goods in. Right. So he's got only a limited amount of time to talk to me and we're talking about different things. And he's telling me that people are selling their homes for Bitcoin, selling their businesses for Bitcoin, because even if Bitcoin crashes, they know that the value of that real estate is going to zero. Like, right. you know, no one's like investing in homes in Gaza. Like they could be blown up. So, um, so he's like, look, worst case, it's the status quo, but best, best case, like Bitcoin keeps doing what it's doing over time. And we're, we're, we're getting out of here. So this guy, like the last thing he said to me basically was like, it's my, like, I'm saving up for my kids and this is my ticket out of here. 
And, and I just think that the, the elites in the West are just so clueless about that, like that even in one of the most restrictive, repressive, dystopian places on Earth, Gaza, people are using Bitcoin to escape. It's just remarkable. Wow. That, that is an amazing story. I mean, I can't wait to read it, but the fact that someone can escape capital controls with technology is it still blows my mind because even I mean, I know well, the, how bad the IMF is and what they've done to places like Jamaica and many other Caribbean countries. And just, I wish that people that didn't have it as bad, that it didn't have to take something that apocalyptic for people to realize how, how you know, how that- well, is. check this out. I, I interviewed another guy. He, he, was, he used to be a banker in, in the West Bank and he quit because he thought that he was guilty and complicit in, everybody's fucking, everybody feels guilty and complicit, everybody I talked to in one way or another, if they were involved. Because since 2007, they've been introducing a lot of credit into the Palestinian society, like a lot of ability to borrow. And yet nobody invests the money into businesses. They all buy like uh, expensive weddings, uh, real estate downtown that they can't afford cars, things like that. So like this guy's saying you might go to Ramallah and actually think it's like a pretty wealthy city in some areas because everything's flashy, but everything is bought with like insane leverage essentially. And he felt like, he was only increasing the dependence of a society on the outside world through what he was doing. So he quit and became a Bitcoiner and we're talking. And what's interesting is like, there's so many different levels of Bitcoin knowledge, right? So this dude's been in Bitcoin for a little while. He knew very little about the lightning network. So while we were talking, I had him download the moon wallet um, and I sent him $5 in lightning. And I'm in, I was in Boston at the time and he's in Ramallah and it literally was an instant, right? And he's just like, wow, this is amazing because there's no checkpoints, there's no delays, there's no trucks, there's no red flags, there's no confiscations. Israel doesn't take a cut. The Palestinian Authority doesn't take a cut. Nobody takes a cut. It was almost free. That's magic, he said. He said, he said it was like magical. And, and then you start thinking about the implications of that, right? Like the average Palestinian living in Europe or wherever, trying to send money back to their family. They got to use Western Union. It's like 30 or 40 bucks to send 500. Um, it takes days. It can get flagged. It can get confiscated. Fuck that. We're just going to yeah. send money directly. And like, and of course, just, privately, like, you know, he's, yeah, and he's relatively like, privately. And like the, the way that these people would talk about Bitcoin as like a bridge or as a connector, like the guy in Gaza told me that he thought it was, it was very beautiful. He said, he said it was like a checkpoint that's always open. And I thought that was a very like, kind of beautiful way to think about it, which is true. I mean, he's like, he asked me to consider how bad the first thing he said was, he's like, think about the last year, how bad it's been in the world around you, like in LA or in Seattle or wherever you are, think about how bad the pandemic's been. Think about how bad the lockdowns have been. Now imagine what it's like for us. And I'm just like, wow, I mean, wow. So through all these stories, what you realize is that the, 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 the mainstream human rights groups like are just missing, like they don't ever mention Bitcoin. There's a very prominent Israeli civil rights group that does awesome work on the subject. Zero mentions of Bitcoin on their website. Uh, the main Palestinian think tank on economic affairs, zero mentions of Bitcoin. The problem is what's going to happen is the World Bank's going to come in and try to work with the PA and Abbas, who, by the way, has been president of West, of essentially, you know, West Bank since 2006. He rules by decree. This is unelected, essentially, at this point. They're going to work together to create a central bank digital currency for the Palestinians. This is going to be a disaster for two reasons. Number one, I mean, the Palestinians, like a Palestinian currency will be very poor currency. Like who's going to want that? They have no capital stock, right? So that's not a viable path for them right now. But number two, it'll it it'll destroy the cash economy, right? So because there's so many restrictions, everybody uses cash in the West Bank because it's freedom. It's a way to escape control. You can save in it. You can transact in it. Um, it's a way to escape control. Well, if you get rid of cash and you have everybody use this like central bank liability on a phone, there's no more escaping the control, right? So this is why it's so important to, to educate people about Bitcoin. And my article is going to go into Arabic as of tomorrow. I'm very excited. I'm happy to share the knowledge and love and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. I mean, I, look, it's just like, I get, again, I think a lot of the activism in today's world, speaking as an activist, who's certainly been guilty of a lot of this, like, dude, it's often virtue signaling. Like what, what is tweeting about something do? Sometimes it's good, but like, dude, a lot of times it doesn't do anything. So 
excited to actually finally have like something that I feel like I can contribute to. I said very little about this Palestinian, the Palestinian issue over the last decade. Cause I just, first of all, I didn't know a lot about it. And I used that as like a mental block essentially, or an excuse. And second of all, I felt like I didn't have anything to add. Yeah. Well, now I have a lot to add and I'm dude, the messages I'm getting from Palestinians are amazing. Like, I mean, they're like, some of these people are like, they're like telling me this is like, the first time they've had hope in a long time and stuff like that. It's pretty intense. So speaking like I think Bitcoin does that for people. Speaking as an accelerationist, right? Or putting on my accelerationist hat on, mm -hmm. do you feel like maybe the fact that they, you know, whatever the ruling, the ruling part of, of the of Gaza is trying to create a CBDC. I don't know if it's the, the Arab League of Nations or whoever that does that. Do you feel like that might actually, if they take away the cash, force people to have to adopt Bitcoin. Oh yeah. No, that's what, yeah. that's what the former banker said that I interviewed. He's like, if this happens, people are just going to flock to Bitcoin. And you know, the mechanisms are imperfect right now. He, what he said, it was really interesting. So in the West bank today, if you try to go make a Binance account and then use your like debit card or uh, wire money to Binance to buy Bitcoin, you get blocked, mm -hmm. but tether works. It's the only digital asset that they allow to work because of whatever reason he says it's a loop he says we always find the holes like so they found this hole it's a loophole so he's telling me that most people in the west bank actually onboard through tether and then from there they'll buy bitcoin as a savings instrument okay uh, and gaza you know obviously it might be different but um that's going to change eventually like obviously tether won't be around forever and I'm just a big believer in this idea of like stabilized lightning channels. I think this is going to be like, honestly, the biggest thing in Bitcoin for the emerging markets, just the ability to have to download a wallet in, let's say the summer of 2023, you'll be anywhere in the world. You'll download a wallet, no KYC, you know, totally non-custodial, you'll control it. And you will be able to receive, earn or buy Bitcoin, have it donated to you, whatever. And you'll be able to like click a button in the wallet and and choose if you wish to peg it to a to a fiat currency. So if you do not want the volatility, someone else is very happy to take that volatility off of you. That, that's what's happening. That will be that what's happening behind the scenes is there's essentially a marketplace, right? Of people who are along Bitcoin versus people who want the exposure to the dollar or the euro or whatever. And right. each wallet maker will have its own mar market essentially. And There'll be a federation of price feeds on the back end. This is only possible post taproot. You need DLCs to do this. But mm -hmm. once these DLCs do it are in Lightning and people are telling me I've been interviewing Lightning developers, they think a year and a half, two years, like this is just gonna make so many things obsolete. Like this, this gives you an incredible power. Like without any connection to the banking system, yeah. you'll be able to use dollars if you want. I mean, it, it's yeah. extremely powerful. So I talked about that with him after I sent him the lightning and he was like, yeah, that's what we need. So, uh, did it's, about it's running a node with him too. Like, did he talk about channels and stuff? I didn't. I mean, that's just, uh, you got to understand that that's, that's, that's like next level. I mean, it's, it's like a learning process. I mean, dude, yeah. I didn't run a node for a long years after I learned about Bitcoin. Right. So you have to know that that's just going to be, it's going to take time. And if look, the easier we make it to run nodes, the better, obviously. But at the end of the day, I think non-custodial use of Bitcoin is the most we can sort of hope for in the, mean, in the near term for like the average uh, new user. And indeed, I mean, that's even a bridge that we need to cross because a lot of people just keep their money in Binance accounts in, the, in, in, in Palestine. A lot of people think hardware wallets are a scam. How are you going to get a freaking hardware wallet if you live in Gaza? Like, so yeah. there's different challenges for different people. Um, but at the end of the day, like Blue Wallet is good enough for now. Guess what you can do with Blue Wallet? So first of all, it has Arabic language compatibility, right to left. It has Arabic. So you're downloading this wallet. It's in Arabic. Okay. You can set up multi-sig with it. So you and, three friend, you and three or four friends can have a three of five. Okay. That way the PA, even if they come to your house at night, they can't take your shit. Okay. So for people who've had their stuff confiscated for decades, that's pretty cool that they can now have like their stuff in, in a way that's unconfiscatable. That's a major innovation. So um, yeah, I mean, and this goes again for like any vulnerable population. I mean, it doesn't, I'm just using Palestine as a general proxy for like dozens of other cases around the world where you have authorities that want to steal from you and confiscate and control you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's happening everywhere. I mean, 
so random. I was just thinking about you talking about Yasser Arafat and in um, one of Fode's videos, there's a park, there's a park Palestine, I think is in the middle of San Salvador. And it was dedicated to Yasser Arafat because like you said, like, you know, there's a rules-based system that we can follow at Bitcoin to make something better, but people don't always follow along. There's people that still actually revere him down there and there's a whole well, political it, conflict around the park. <laughs> it's well, crazy. but it's like any of these revolutionary leaders that went rotten. I mean, yeah. without discussing his PLO days, like there's tons of revolutionary leaders that 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 became dictators or corrupt or whatever. I mean, look at freaking Fidel Castro. Look at uh, Robert Mugabe. I mean, look at even some of the ones who got elected in the beginning, like Putin or Hugo Chavez or Erdogan yeah, in Turkey. Even Gaddafi seems to start off really good, right? You, you never know. Absolutely. For today's standpipe. It's going to be palestine.onelovebitcoin.com. You guys can go there. You can get some free sats. Make sure you have a lightning wallet. I always say, hey, Jamaicans, go there. But honestly, if you're from Palestine, you should go there too. Each one of these faucets, I would love to spread around the world to each country that it's named after. So if you're from Palestine, check it out. If you're from Jamaica, telling you to check it out and if you're from the u.s as usual go to swanbitcoin.com slash rastafari and go get some free bitcoin on your own while you buy while you dca all right guys back to the show so again a lot of these folks who start a revolution you know they they, they don't finish it and they end up in many cases making the country worse yeah. so what's inarguable about Arafat, despite the fact that he was so revered around the world for various reasons, even he won a Nobel Peace Prize, um, <laughs> is that he was worth billions by the time he died and he was siphoning off all this money. And, and again, this goes back to the money issue of the mechanisms, right? That, that Bitcoiners are really interested in. They wanna know about how the money works. So basically through the Paris Protocol, which is this document that was drawn up as part of the Oslo Accords that governs Palestinian uh fiscal monetary economic policy trade tourism all the stuff basically what, what would happen what was laid out was that israel would actually get to control everything going into the palestinian territories which is one of the reasons they agreed to the oslo accords was that they knew they'd have they'd retain economic control right which is oslo, which is, or oslo two oslo two they this was it? yeah this was well they, those, so the paris protocol was signed separately in 94 during the first wave and then it was incorporated as like annex five or something like that as part of oslo two okay. in, in late 95 but it, but it was basically th what i'm saying is that the israelis agreed to give the palestinians political economy partly because they knew they could keep the economic autonomy the, their economic control so any when the palestinians are buying anything from abroad that they're importing or exporting it all has to go through an Israeli correspondent bank and what ha and and a huge amount of Palestinians, of course, work in Israel. And now they would get Israel gets control over their, the, you know, essentially the, the money that they make, things like that. Yeah. So what hap what happens is like, first of all, the, the Israelis basically take every month, once a month, they collect all of the VAT, customs duties, taxes, all these things, and then they clear it to the PA like once a month, this is how it works mechanically, like the Ministry of Finance in Israel does a wire to the PA in shekels. So they, they credit their account, right? So what happens though, is that sometimes like <laughs> it's a month. So where does that money go in the meantime? Oh, it earns interest in Israeli banks. Like it, it, it can be used for loans to, to pay people back. Like, and they do do this. And sometimes when they want to apply pressure, they withhold the money, right? So mm -hmm. all same thing, all the foreign aid, same thing, it comes in this way. And the Israelis charge like a 3% processing fee, which ends up being like very significant, actually, like a, like a non-trivial percentage of Palestinian GDP. I, in my article, I use a number that I found of about 3.7% of GDP, of the Palestinian GDP is leaked to the Israeli treasury through this stuff. That's per year, okay? So the mechanisms are, are strange. And they're, they're not stacked favorably. So again, this is similar to many, many countries. Like the, again, there's like a political class that that absorbs uh, the people's earnings one way or another. In a dictatorship, it's going to be a family. In the case of a Palestinian, it's like half the Israeli occupiers and half the Palestinian corrupt, you know, 
or Hamas or whatever. So Mm -hmm. no matter where you live, there's like some sort of layer on top of people that are like absorbing, um, you know, usually unfairly the money. And I, I think this goes down to philosophy. Like there are a lot of people who just sort of believe that money is a, a creature of Caesar and that it's like something that states make and that it's like money comes from governments, right? They have this belief, this charterist belief, right? That underlines a lot of like kind of left-wing economic thinking. And it's like, I don't know if they stop to think about the fact that 53% of the world lives under an authoritarian regime. So if you believe that money can only be created by the state or that, or that money is a creature of the state, well, that's not a very nice arrangement for the people who live in dictatorships and authoritarian regimes, right? So regardless of all your debates about what is money, I don't really care. You can have those debates. Meanwhile, we're over here using this new money. You, you don't, you know, they don't like, they, they, they you know, they refuse to call it money. I, I could care less about the semantics. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely money and we're going to use it like money. <laughs> like, so you could, you, you could be over there with your like, oh, it's not money. I could literally care less that you don't think it's money. We're literally using it for earning, saving, spending, and we're soon going to be using it trustlessly for loans and capital creation and all kinds of stuff. So go ahead, mock it, say it's a digital collectible, whatever the hell you want to call it, um, deride it, you know. And I think a lot of it also has to do with um, the media. I mean, you know, these elites are able to criticize Bitcoin because they they kind of have like the media on their side in terms of the media will, will run out of every 20 stories about Bitcoin, 18 or 19 are negative. And, and they'll, they'll talk about how volatile it is or dangerous or risky. And you're like, oh my God, like if you live in Lebanon or Syria, I mean, dude, this could have changed your life or saved you had you started using this thing three, four years ago. Like I've spoken to people who, who had their lives saved in this way, whether they were living in Venezuela or Lebanon or whatever. And that the media was telling you that this was dangerous and risky. No, no, no. With hindsight, we can see that it was dangerous or risky to not have Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah. And now hindsight's 2020, but like, it's also history. Like we have 12 years of evidence now showing that it was dangerous or risky to not be in Bitcoin. Now, the media has gaslit the people that they have they have convinced psychologically the average person that Bitcoin is dangerous or risky, when in reality it was the opposite. So I know that you know blah blah blah. Past performance doesn't indicate future returns, dude. No, like like we we have twelve years of this, and the monetary. If you one thing, if the monetary policy of governments was like tightening and and getting more responsible. But like, we're in the midst of a historic moment where governments are realizing that they can just basically print as much money as they want, and they'll get some inflation. And that's, that's the limit of the printing. And you look at the balance sheet of the ECB and the Fed, which are, again, way more responsible than any of these dictatorships. And, and it's, Staggering. I mean, they're they're acquiring so much of the private sector through bond buy purchasing and stocks and st- stocks and stuff like that. Like they're like bond, they're bailing out the private sector. They're artificially raising the price of bonds and stocks and equities and all real estate, all kinds of things by pumping this new money into the. It's literally what's happening. So, you know, with Bitcoin, we can just we can just get out of this. We can just you know opt into this global neutral open money standard that's equal for the guy in Gaza and Jeff Bezos. Like, sure, Bezos can buy more, but he can't prevent the guy in Gaza from using it. And he has no special abilities over it. And his Bitcoin is not any better than the Bitcoin of that guy. Right. So once you understand that, it's it's a pretty amazing uh, kind of penny drop. I agree. I agree. And and the biggest part about that is not only can Jeff Bezos not stop the guy from buying more, he can't stop the guy from owning less over time. Like, right. He can't debase him (laughs) or demonetize, which is like, I encounter this a lot. Like, yes, I'm a big fan of cash. Cash is very important. Obviously it's more private than Bitcoin right now, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But in addition to it being obviously limited by it being physical and like, you can't teleport it. Um, you can have demonetization. So in India, North Korea, Eritrea, many places, what the government did is they were like, oh, this like particular note, oh, we're just going to like phase that out. So you have to come bring it to us. Or in Sudan, they would demonetize everything. So numerous times, all of the notes in the country, you had like a month or two months to return them. Yeah, and here's, here's your new one. And of course, the government takes a haircut. So they literally steal from the people. Whenever 
there's a big demonetization event. It's essentially the government stealing the time and energy of the people. It's very, very unfair and, and, and horribly repressive and, and just looting, basically. So again, this, this, this gives us a way out of not just debasement, but demonetization too, which I think is quite important. Yeah, I didn't even think about that because in my lifetime, it's happened once or twice in Jamaica. It's a whole new way of you know stealing inflation, um, excessive taxation, and then I didn't even realize demonetization is also. Yeah, they're like, here are these new notes that are worth whatever amount, and like the the, the difference is what they're taking from you. Um, and again, these haircuts have happened in just dozens of countries around the world. Like every time there's a currency change, like I mean, you've seen this: the Venezuelan government, the Iranian government, they will just take off a bunch of zeros and issue new notes. I mean. Yep. With, with fancy new paper, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. like it, it's funny, and it goes all the way up to the, to you know, a centralized organization like the IMF that's driving a lot of the policies that force these countries to do these things anyway. Not force, because they're kind of in cahoots, but like, I mean, when you were talking about the about Palestine basically not being able to produce for themselves mm -hmm. because they, you know, they were being de undercut by all these um, outside forces. That's exactly what IMF did to Jamaica. Like they mm -hmm. forced them into loans that had them to open up their borders and let people come and undercut them with, you know, yep. it was essentially slave labor from South America and ended up all the farmers going out of business for, for cane, for bananas, for milk, milk had to be thrown away. It was, it was all the same reason. because Yes. Yeah. So what's interesting now is that you get this geopolitical phenomenon where you know, what can a country do if it needs to, to finance something? Sell off reserves, which is not ideal. Um, you could do debt financing, which is usually very expensive, uh, or, or you could seek foreign aid, which of course results in what you're describing in terms of your country being kind of a slave to the World Bank or IMF, and they come and they impose structural reforms if you don't, you know, if you don't pay your loan back on time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, now there's a fifth way, right? You can, you can, sell volcano bonds or hydro bonds or solar bonds, or you, you, you'll be able to sell, uh, you know, shares in unrealized renewable energy um, that your country has. And this wasn't possible before Bitcoin mining. So you're, you're seeing it happen in El Salvador. Obviously, they're raising about 450 million in volcano bonds for, mm -hmm. for this huge project they're building, which is going to have enormous returns for the country. Um, every single country in Latin America on the western coast of or rather the eastern shore of the Pacific has enormous amounts of untapped geothermal energy. Um, same in Central Africa. Uh, Kenya, I just learned the other day, is the world's fifth largest uh, geothermal producer, um, right there on the Afri Great African Rift Valley. So Tanzania, Kenya, Burundi, I mean, Rwanda, Eastern Congo, uh, you know, the, the Malawi, these countries have enormous amounts because of geothermal. Yeah. Africa is incredibly rich in, in, in resources, but they haven't really been able to monetize them for various reasons. So now along comes Bitcoin mining. And I think a lot of these places will be able to basically raise the money from outside investors based on expected returns in the future of mining off of those renewable uh, renewables. And, and this way, no IMF, no World Bank, no structural reforms. No, they're like treated as peers at the table with everybody else. And I, I think that that's going to be really interesting. Uh, that is that is an exciting future I'm looking forward to. So I don't, you know, I don't know what that holds for Jamaica, given that, you know, for small island nations, there's, you know, typically you have less, but I mean, certainly solar. I mean, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know. Again, like there's other stuff lurking. Um, obviously in the Caribbean, there's going to be quite a few countries, smaller countries that can do geothermal projects. So um, <laughs> as, 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 uh, as probably has been uh, a bane of their existence in the last couple hundred years, whenever a volcano would explode on one of these islands. Hey, I mean, you can now use that to your benefit. So um, we'll have to see. But but certainly an interesting thing that, that, as we've discussed, not just Bitcoin empowering individuals, but also empowering developing nations, you know, in a world where they are unfairly treated uh, or rather they face like huge disadvantages versus great powers. Yeah. We're just much, much further away from the spigot, you know, from where all that's being printed. So, you know, yeah, especially for, especially because you're like El Salvador that, that, you know, has dollarized out of necessity. I mean, again, like yeah. they don't benefit from the extra money printing, you know? Exactly. Well, I, I really hope that I get to continue reading your articles. Um, the long form articles really get me immersed in them. Like the stories that I've, 
I, every time I hear a story, I'm like, okay, I need to dig into this country more because I want to learn everything about it. And um, I'm looking forward to all the rest of them. And I'm looking forward to this Palestine one as well. I know it's a beast of a read, but <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be digging into it right after this. I got two questions for you before, before we wrap it up. Uh -huh. um, one, I always ask, what is your favorite song? Because I like to play like your type of music at the beginning of the, the episode. Ooh. Um, it depends. I'm very eclectic in my music tastes. Um, I've been listening to a bunch of electronica recently while I've been writing, but my favorite music is probably Radiohead. Um, so I would maybe go off uh something from uh from kid a or uh from hail to the thief or in rainbows um okay. uh, you know an opening riff of one of those songs i, I also think there, there's um a lot of the uh radiohead songs have great political um messages that resonate with bitcoin with with bitcoin i think Two plus two equals five is obviously a great one. And um, nice. uh, No Surprises is really good. They talk about bringing down the government in that one. I remember being at Madison Square Garden watching them and uh, I, uh, the crowd went wild when they, <laughs> there's this part of the refrain where they're like, bring down the government and everybody's like screaming. It's great. So, so I like that. Yeah. Okay. I might be using one of those. And then, um, I guess this is more around, you know, how, how it, it came to you, but did you have the whole three touch thing happen or was, was your exposure to Bitcoin kind of in 2017, you're like, all right, I need to dig into it. Or was it like a 2013, 14 moment where you're like, ah, that's just. No, I was like, I'm a, I'm, I did one of these personality tests. I'm like 99% skeptical. So I'm like more skeptical than 99 out of a hundred people in the room. So when I first heard about it, I was just like, eh, you know, and again, I had a lot of exposure. I like, spent a lot of time with Bitcoin people in 2013, 14, 15. I just didn't, it just didn't click for me that it was relevant to my work. Um, and uh, finally, I just, it just, I was sort of forced to, to say, hey, I need to learn more about this because we were going to do some Bitcoin programming in spring of 2017. And um, I just basically listened to all of Andreas Antonopoulos' talks and stuff at the mm -hmm. time, which were very, very powerful. I mean, I started to understand it through his explanations and then went from there into Jimmy song stuff and everybody else. And that's kind of how I made my, my, uh, I had my understanding. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was not, I did not have like a day, you know, one day or hour penny drop. It was super, super gradual. Um, it took years, um, for me to really grasp it. Nice. It's good for everyone to know that, you know, no one's superhuman. Like you let you took your time and did the work like everyone else, you know? Yeah, I had to put in a lot of work because, you know, again, at the beginning, you're like, so like, you're like, oh, Bitcoin, but also all these other cryptocurrencies and like blockchain and like that, that's just what happens to everybody because you don't know any better. And then it, you have to put in the time to realize that all these other assets are literally fiat currencies that a small group of people control. And they might be interesting for whatever reason, but they're not Bitcoin and, and nothing else is. And they are in many ways gonna be uh, vulnerable to the same problems as the fiat currency system, as, as the very reason why you have a bailout of the banks in the first Genesis block of Bitcoin. Like there is ability to change the monetary policy of every other cryptocurrency. So, I mean, that, that's really what we're trying to escape, right? Um, and in Bitcoin, like we have that escape. And, and I think that's just like what's so, so important. And that takes a long time to learn. Um, yeah, it takes a long time to learn. And um, I'm really looking forward to, to um, seeing what happens at the Oslo uh, Freedom Forum mm -hmm. as well, because yeah, you know, it's, it's going to be awesome. Not only is it, yeah, it's, it's like, not only is it um, aligned with what I'm trying to do, it also teaches me how to respond and react. Because it's not just, you know, bringing Bitcoin knowledge, it's also bringing activism knowledge that I'm, I'm you know, still trying to learn myself in a fledging, fledgling state, I would say. I'm just an observer. So it's really interesting to, to see how many different angles you start looking at the world from once you, you know, open yourself up to more than just one, one country, really, or one, one culture or one way of living. It's a great experience to give and receive, basically, is what I've found that um, you have a chance to help, but also grow your mind and, um, 
I call it a bubble breaking machine, the Oslo Freedom Forum, because it just breaks all these bubbles about how you think about the world, um, which, which is why I'm uh, excited about it and uh, really, really excited about the ability to mix the Bitcoin community with the global human rights community. That's always like a big dream of mine to do. And we get to do it. So what an honor. We'll do it. We'll, <laughs> we'll get it done. We'll, well, orange, if you, we're, we'll, if you, we'll orange pill the, the red pill, folks. I like that. Orange pill the red pill. <laughs> Alex, I know it's been like about an hour. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Um, but if you have anything else you wanted to tell, you know, my, all the people that watch this show, whoever it is around the world, you know, let them know, you know, who you are, where they can reach you, um, how they can see your articles and your mm -hmm. stories and everything else. Yeah, uh, you can follow me at Gladstein on Twitter. Uh, I'm building a little website for all my writings at Alex, um, uh, alexgladstein.com. Um, I, I also have at Bitcoin Magazine a, an archive of, of like a series I've, I started um, in um, April that began with a piece about why Bitcoin is a Trojan horse and has, has gone through like a lot of geopolitics. So... I've done seven or eight pieces, which I will probably put into a book um, later this year, which I'll, which I'll, you know, publish and it'll be basically like, you know, geopolitics of Bitcoin or something like that. Nice. But e each one of the stories I'm doing is, is it will be a chapter basically. Okay. You should have like Audible by Guy Swan or something. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, Guy is killing it. Every single one of my pieces you can, you can listen to, which is super cool. And Guy is no doubt working through the Palestine one as we speak, because it's really long. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so grateful to him, but uh, yeah, amazing guy. Cool, man. Well, thanks for all the time you've given us today. And um, one love, brother. I'll see you soon. Thank you.